day began like any other for Cheryl and Paul Chapman until the silence of a peaceful Sunday morning was shattered with a phone call. Cheryl's sister Nancy had not shown up for work and several attempts to reach her by phone were unsuccessful. The Chapmans, sensing something must be wrong, Nancy? rushed to her apartment. Some killers are stealthy, killing with an almost clinical precision. Others act on a violent impulse, saturating the crime scene with their rage. How a murderer behaves tells much about who he is. In 1987, the brutality of a triple homicide in Anchorage tested the mettle of even the most seasoned investigators. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former director of the FBI's New York office. When Nancy Newman and her two young daughters were found slain in their apartment, local law enforcement needed help. They called the FBI. At the crime scene, clues were everywhere, but seemed to lead nowhere. Agents knew that to crack this case, they need to somehow get inside the killer's mind. Alaska sits on the edge of the wilderness seemingly isolated from the rest of the world and its troubles. Its inhabitants are united by the beauty of the landscape and a mutual respect for the self-reliant nature of the community. On the rocky coast of northern France, where the Atlantic Ocean crashes ashore, the villagers of Karnak wake up each day to a little... It was shortly before 8 a.m. on a Sunday, March 15, 1987, Cheryl and Paul Chapman were awakened by a phone call. No. Cheryl's sister, Nancy Newman, was hours late for the breakfast shift at the restaurant where she worked. Nancy's shift manager told Cheryl that Nancy's car was in the restaurant parking lot, but Nancy was nowhere in sight. Maybe the Chapman should check on her. From the moment Paul and Cheryl arrived at Nancy's apartment, they sensed something was wrong. There was no sign of Nancy. Her two daughters, eight-year-old Melissa and three-year-old Angie, were nowhere in sight. Coffee mugs from Cheryl's Friday night visit with her sister were still in the sink. The remains of breakfast had been left on the table. The tin where Nancy kept her tip money sat empty. And a brown cigarette butt, not a brand Nancy smoked, was in the ashtray. Nancy? Nancy? In Nancy's bedroom, Paul made a gruesome discovery. He found Nancy lying beaten and lifeless on her bed. Paul rushed to the other bedrooms to find Nancy's two girls. To his horror, he found Melissa and Angie brutally murdered. Emergency. Yes, we need the police, please. What's the problem? Uh, it's been a homicide. 
homicide? Our sister-in-law didn't show up from work. They called us at our house by Norfolk Center. We came over to find her. 4310. Within minutes, the first Anchorage police officers arrived at the Newman's apartment. Not wanting to disturb the crime scene, the officers secured the area and tried to calm the distraught family until the crime scene processing unit arrived. <laughs> what police found was horrific. Nancy and Melissa Newman appeared to have been beaten and strangled. Little Angie Newman's throat was cut so deeply she was almost decapitated. Anchorage police officer Bill Gifford was at the scene. Well, the impact of a case like this is uh, well, quite often it's hard to capture in words. We're pretty used to working uh, homicide cases and serious assault cases. And overall, I think a community becomes, uh, oh, if not callous, somewhat accustomed to these kind of things happening, just the uh, a typical murder. Something of this magnitude, however, people are never prepared for. The murders were so gruesome that even experienced police officers were shaken. It uh, is shocking for the, for the public, and it takes a toll on, its, uh, on the investigators and the officers working the case as well, because you're uh, just not used to seeing, uh, as I mentioned, things of this magnitude. Nancy Newman's body was lying on her bed, her nightgown hiked up around her chest. There were abrasions on her nose, chin, and forehead, and a knee seemed to be injured. Blood stains were at the foot of the bed. A pair of olive green gloves were on top of the dresser. Good idea of color. Yeah, do a scrape so you can get some. Down the hall, Melissa Newman was found on her back in the middle of her room. A bloody, twisted pillowcase under her neck. Another pillowcase had been used to tie her arms. Three-year-old Angie Newman lay on her bedroom floor in a pool of blood, surrounded by her favorite books. Couple shots, couple shots of the face. There's the bed where all the blood is. Everybody's ready? Here Blood stain pattern analysis often yields clues. The positions of the victims and killer the movements of the victims, and the number of blows struck can be reconstructed by an experienced examiner. In this particular case, it assisted us in uh, establishing a sequence of events. Stains found on Nancy Newman's bed suggested that she and Melissa had been forced down the hall to her mother's room, where they were assaulted and stains on the hallway carpeting indicated that Melissa was then returned to her room and killed there. Officers treated each area as a completely separate crime scene. First, they determined the type of physical evidence that was likely to be found, and then the order it should be processed. How are we doing? Given the horrific nature of this crime and the lack of an obvious suspect, investigators knew that every possible piece of physical evidence was potentially invaluable. Detective Sergeant Michael Grimes was in charge of the Anchorage Police Department's Homicide, Assault and Robbery Unit. 
I knew that they were going to be in this crime scene for hours and hours and hours. Uh, this immediately is what we, we identify as a forensic case. There was very little disturbed uh, by them when they found the body, so we were very fortunate in that respect. Investigators frequently find evidence in common household dirt. Sometimes hair and fibers buried in carpeting can be traced to a suspect. For thorough coverage, investigators broke each room into quadrants and vacuumed each section. To begin the painstaking task, investigators must first cordon off a three foot by four foot area of the room. The investigator uses an ordinary vacuum with a special filter attachment. As the debris is pulled off the floor, it travels down a short tube and then goes into a collection point. There it becomes trapped in clean filter paper. Once a quadrant of the room has been processed, the filter is removed and placed into an evidence container. Many minute hairs and fibers are missed by crime scene vacuumings. Therefore, a portable argon laser is used, which causes unseen hairs and fibers to fluoresce when exposed to the laser's light. A technique called luminol processing was also used to look for traces of blood. If present, the luminol spray will cause the proteins in the blood to fluoresce, making them visible to examiners. Yeah. Take a shot of it. We were processing the, the scene and looking for invisible traces or invisible blood patterns. And we found a luminescent impression that we were able to photograph. We also knew we had a, a knife missing out of the kitchen. We took one of those knives out of the knife set and we found that matched uh, in width and length to the uh, to that of the uh, of the luminol impression that we had. The crime scene appearance suggested the murderer had taken the victims by surprise. It appeared that Newman's morning routine was suddenly interrupted, perhaps indicating that they knew the killer. Okay, excellent. Good job. A big question was motive. At the scene, Cheryl told police that Nancy seemed to have no enemies. As a waitress, she was popular among her customers and colleagues, friendly without being flirtatious. And what possible motive could explain the rage inflicted upon eight-year-old Melissa and three-year-old Angie? Burglary was unlikely. It was obvious to investigators that the apartment had not been ransacked or otherwise disturbed. Investigators struggled to find a solid lead. Detective Bill Reeder worked the case from the beginning. The initial lead uh, came from the scene itself, but we could find no signs of forced entry. So that kind of leaned us toward looking at people that had access to the apartment or knew the, knew the victims. Immediately the questioning began. Neighbors, family and friends, anyone who may have had information. What we were looking at was to find someone that had seen anything unusual, uh, any strangers in the area, had heard anything unusual, had seen someone carrying things away, uh, anything at all that would help us uh, focus on, on someone or somebody. Family members are almost always suspects early in an investigation. Paul Chapman was no exception. Though he had no one to back up his alibi, which was that he was alone most of Saturday. His reaction to discovering the bodies was clearly one of trauma and loss. Investigators spoke with everyone close to the family and learned that Nancy Newman was happily married to John Newman, 
the father of their two girls. He was a suspect, spouses usually are. But John Newman was in California training to be a locksmith at the time of the murders. Another way to eliminate a suspect is to watch and continue to talk to him. Uh, John never gave us any indication other than he wanted this case solved. Uh, he was extremely distraught. Gave all the signs that anybody would give under the circumstances. Because the Newmans lived in a multi-unit apartment complex, Detective Grimes knew that interviewing neighbors in the immediate area would be a daunting task. It was an apartment in a multi-unit apartment house, which was in a particular area of town that uh, was surrounded by large multi-unit uh, apartment houses. Uh, and we were looking at literally hundreds of, of dwellings in that area. The close-knit community of Anchorage was shocked by the brutality of the murders. Police investigators, having no experience with crimes this shocking, were asking the most frightening of all possible questions. Was a serial killer a possibility? Police felt pressured to work quickly. For what kind of person would do this kind of crime? Uh, was there significance in the way the people were murdered uh, that could give us some kind of leads as to who we were looking for, or at least what type of person? And uh, so immediately, I'd say within the first day or so, we were getting some help from the FBI. Investigators quickly realized they needed help in determining the type of individual responsible for the murders. They turned to the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit in Quantico, Virginia. Special Agent Judd Ray received the call. As a profiler in the unit, Ray's job was to assist investigators in hunting down America's worst killers. To do that, Ray had to understand the workings of a killer's mind. We were looking at deeds and acts of individuals after it happened and trying to predict the kind of personality, if you will, a composite view of what kind of human being could have done it. Through detailed evaluations of crime scene photos and police reports, Ray provided investigators with a psychological portrait of the killer. This is a disorganized uh, crime scene. I mean, you know, low self-esteem, all the kind of things that you would say about uh, about this kind of person, you know, that uh, he's been, uh, he's, uh, <clears throat> society has rejected him through the years, and now it's his time to reject society. Ray told the Anchorage detectives that they possibly faced a repeat performance. This particular incident alarmed him so much, particularly with, uh, you know, three victims at one time, two being children. Uh, that his opinion also, he said that, uh, you know, we need to get something working on this right away because uh, it appears that this person's out of control and there's the potential that uh, uh, he's going to be doing it again in the very near future. From the autopsy reports, investigators learned that Nancy and eight-year-old Melissa Newman had been sexually assaulted. Based on this information and characteristics of the crime, Ray concluded that this violent offender would have a history of sexual assault. He would be a white male in his early to mid-twenties, an underachiever. Following Ray's conclusions, investigators began to narrow the range of possible suspects. Among them was a young man who had recently moved in a few doors down from the Newmans. Police also questioned Kirby Anthony, the 23-year-old nephew of John Newman. Anthony had an alibi into the morning hours of Saturday, March 14th, but the neighbor did not. There was a tremendous uh, rage that was inflicted uh, on the almost decapitated the uh, the young three-year-old. Suggested that they, to me, that 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 that, that, that there's nothing. Uh, in my mind that I had uh, came across that would uh, have been sufficient on its face to justify this kind of rage by a stranger. 
Ray's insistence that the killer was known to the victims led investigators to shift focus away from the man who lived nearby. Neighbors and friends of the Newmans confirmed the young man's claim that he had never met Nancy Newman or her children. Because I had talked about familiarity, somebody that's close to the family, somebody that knows her, that had some sort of relationship with her, perhaps even been rejected by her. Uh, they said, well, as a matter of fact, there's a nephew that comes to mind. As investigators continued questioning possible suspects, the volume of evidence that had been collected from the crime scene was taxing the limits of Alaska's state crime lab. Once again, Anchorage police turned to the FBI. The evidence was sent to the FBI's crime lab in Washington, D.C. Hair and fiber expert Doug Dietrich was given the case. Dietrich began by sorting through the evidence, searching for any link to a suspect. Hairs, fibers, glass particles, soil, paint chips, anything that may have been transferred during the killer's violent contact with his victims. Uh, altogether, I believe I looked at three, over 300, close to 400 items of evidence from the crime scene, from the victims, from elimination samples from different people, both suspect and relatives and possible acquaintances. Fibers are unusually difficult to trace. And because no one knew what the killer was wearing during the murders, there was no basis in which to compare recovered fibers. The varieties that are out there uh, are endless. So that when an individual in a case, for instance, who is wearing a particular type of clothing uh, transfers fiber material, that evidence will, will be considered to be unique. Even though they may have made a number of garments of the same type, by the time it gets out into the public, this material is dispersed like a drop of oil in the ocean. It just, it's there, but it's hard to find. Distinct fibers, amounting to less than a thimble full of evidence, were recovered from throughout the Newman's apartment. Diedrich's expertise of fiber transfer, however, enabled him to reconstruct the suspect's movements during the crime giving investigators a clearer picture of what actually transpired in the apartment. As Diedrich's analysis progressed, Anchorage police asked Kirby Anthony to come to the police department to give more detailed statements. They began to learn more of his story. And Rose? Anthony and his girlfriend had moved from Twin Falls, Idaho to Anchorage 18 months earlier. Both had stayed at the Newmans for a while, but were asked to leave about the time they found jobs on a fishing boat. He and his girlfriend split up while working on the boat after Kirby accused her of having an affair with the skipper. His mates described him as irrational and unstable after the breakup. He clashed with the skipper and was fired. He returned to Anchorage alone on February 14th, 1987. Having nowhere else to go, Anthony took a taxi from the airport straight to the Newlands. Through Cheryl Chapman's continued assistance, Police learned that John Newman was upset over his nephew's return to the Newman household during his absence. At the same time, the situation was becoming increasingly uncomfortable for Nancy. After a few weeks, she asked Anthony to leave. 
he moved in with an acquaintance, Dan Grant. As the investigation began to focus on Kirby Anthony, Sergeant Grimes recalled his first encounter with him. The day of the murders, Detective Grimes took on the task of notifying Anthony about the deaths. I told him that uh, we had some bad news for him, that uh, his aunt and, uh, and her two little girls had been found dead just earlier that morning. Uh, as I recall, Curly, Kirby uh, grabbed his hair and, and started wailing and, and moaning, uh, but it was all dry-eyed, there was no tears. Anthony's demeanor did not fit that of a grieving family member. But Grimes knew that Anthony's odd behavior would never justify an arrest. Well, I know I was, but the autopsy report, however, made investigators more suspicious. Autopsy results helped pinpoint the murders between 7 a.m. and noon on Saturday, March 14th. What we're able to demonstrate is that the murders happened early in the morning, after the victims had, had uh, gotten up in the morning. The, uh, one of the victims had had a bowl of cereal. The other was in the process of eating some cereal. The mother was in the process of having a cup of coffee. Establishing the time of the deaths made Anthony's alibi irrelevant, which was that he was at an all-night party until early that Saturday morning. He admitted that he drank, smoked some marijuana, and did cocaine. Hey man, wake up. Get up, man. He said he returned yeah, to the house he shared with Dan Grant at about 7 a.m., then left again at about 8.45 a.m. Meanwhile, FBI agent Diedrich's investigation into fiber and hair evidence was growing more complicated. Uh, one of the items that had come in uh, it consisted of vacuum sweepings. At least there were several vacuum sweepings from different rooms. Those items have to be processed and hairs have to be prepared from that. What was, I think, probably the most difficult aspect of this case for me was in trying to account for every hair that was found in that residence. And that's something that's not usually done and, and uh, seen as there, there are often too many hairs to deal with. Uh, but in this case, it was, it was a monumental task to do that. Each hair displays its own peculiar characteristics under a microscope, making it possible to trace its likely origin. The fact that hairs will differ from person to person is, is very evident when you magnify these characteristics upwards of 250, 400 times. To examine the fibers and hairs collected at the scene, Diedrich used two high-powered comparison microscopes connected by an optical bridge, one for known material and the other for material yet to be identified. Because Anthony had lived with the Newmans for a while, his hair was likely to be in the apartment. That meant it was important to establish whether the trace hairs were old or recent. So Diedrich went through the contents of the vacuum used in the Newman household. Because of the vast quantities of hairs and other items that were found in the bag, uh, I had to look at the vacuum bag from a layer standpoint. That is, what was the most recently deposited or recently vacuumed material. Since Kirby Anthony had denied being in the Newman's apartment recently, it was imperative that Diedrich determine the condition of the hairs. The condition of the surface of hairs, uh, the condition of the ends, the roots, uh, will often indicate how long a hair may have been in a particular environment. Working his way through the layers of the Newman's vacuum bag, Diedrich found some of the same types of hairs that did not appear to belong to any of the Newmans. These hairs had been recently deposited. In addition to the vacuum sweepings, unidentified pubic hairs were also found on the victims and inside their bedrooms. 
To determine the significance of these findings, Diedrich now wanted to know how hairs usually are transferred from one room to another. So he conducted his own experiment. Uh, it was a question as to how likely would it be to find somebody's hairs, say, say pubic hairs, in different areas of a home. So I designed a, a little experiment where I took uh, a vacuum home, crime scene vacuum to my house and vacuumed four bedrooms over a two week period, same time every day, just to see what types of hairs might be found. I was focusing mainly on pubic hairs. Diedrich preserved the material from every sweeping. He then compared the hairs from those sweepings with known hairs from himself. Diedrich was able to conclude that the hairs did migrate from room to room, mostly by sticking to socks or other clothing. The hairs deposited at the beginning of the experiment were deeper in the vacuum debris and therefore more damaged. The more recently deposited ones were not. The finding was significant to Diedrich. Since Cheryl told police that Nancy vacuumed her house Friday, the unidentified hairs found on the victims would have been deposited right at the time of the murders. Under microscopic scrutiny, an important piece of evidence was revealed. A pubic hair with a partial egg casing, the kind associated with genital lice, was clinging to the damp washcloth found in the Newman's bathroom. Diedrich told investigators of his findings and waited for a sample from a suspect in order to make a comparison. There were at least a half a dozen individuals who were considered prime suspects. Investigators received lists from the State Corrections Department of people recently released who had a history of sex crimes or violence. Some of them were living in the area close to the Newmans. To eliminate these individuals as suspects, each one was extensively questioned and all of their alibis were checked out. Police continued to question Anthony. He admitted nothing. But with each interview, the details of where he was and what he did the morning of the murders changed slightly. That was a, uh, kind of a, uh, an indicator of what we were going to be dealing with with Kirby from the get-go, was these little lies that weren't necessary but were thrown out to us. Unaware of Diedrich's hair analysis, Anthony was asked by investigators to submit hair and blood samples. Wanting to appear cooperative, he voluntarily submitted the samples. They were rushed to Diedrich for comparison. The next day, Diedrich notified investigators that Anthony had pubic lice. Well, that was probably the most significant breakthrough. Uh, at that point, we could start focusing on Kirby as the suspect. When confronted with the evidence of the hair and egg casing on the washcloth, Anthony admitted that he did have lice. He said he had showered at the Newmans a week before the murders so as not to spread the pubic lice at Dan Grant's house. For Judd Ray, the dirty washcloth left at the crime scene told much about the suspect. The killer had cleaned himself at the murder scene. Why take the risk? Why not go home? It was obvious to me that he had to that he had to go somewhere where he, where, where he couldn't go there all bloody, uh, 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 which sort of got into this guy's not a loner living living alone somewhere. Ray's behavioral profile also predicted the killer would have been associated with a previous sexual assault. This prediction prompted investigators to look deeper into Kirby's past. They learned that Kirby Anthony had been the central suspect in an Idaho case that remains open to this day. The victim, a 12-year-old girl, suffered brain damage in the attack and was unable to testify. He had... Uh just previous to coming to Alaska, uh, been the focus of police attention down there. They had a uh, some type of uh, outdoor picnic outing, and uh, 
There was a 12-year-old that was found in the woods. She had been strangled unconscious uh, near death, uh, and she had been sexually assaulted. Uh, their investigation uh, pointed right at Kirby Anthony. Ray also predicted the killer would want to appear cooperative with police. They told us that the suspect would, would interject himself into the investigation. Uh, he would call to find out what the evidence was showing, and Kirby started doing that. What investigators did not share with Anthony was that Diedrich's other hair comparisons were also pointing to Anthony. The pubic hair found on the washcloth was only one of many positive associations Diedrich was able to make between hairs found at the crime scene and those submitted by Anthony. And in this case, uh, a number of pubic hairs that were like Kirby Anthony's were found in, in the rooms, both uh, the victim's rooms, the two girls, and as well as a couple of them that were similar to his on the bed of the mother. A hair from Anthony's head also was found on the top sheet of Nancy Newman's bed. Facial hairs that matched Anthony's beard were found on all of the victims and in their rooms. The vacuum sweepings from Melissa's room contained nine of Anthony's pubic hairs. The sweepings from Angie's room included two pubic hairs, one with blood and one with lice casings. Investigators felt it was time to keep tabs on Anthony's movements. Through surveillance, investigators learned of Anthony's hangouts and discreetly followed him around town. They hoped that Anthony would reveal something to his friends that would further implicate him in the murders. If he did, the investigators would soon find out. The effort paid off. One of Anthony's acquaintances told investigators that he was writing poetry on napkins and passing the poems around the table. He told one of the women that Nancy Newman had been forced to watch part of the assault. Investigators also learned that at one point after the murders, Anthony called his ex-girlfriend's mother in Idaho to tell her about the crime. Angie Newman had been stabbed, he said, and Nancy and Melissa sexually assaulted. In both instances, the call to Idaho and the scene at the bar, Anthony could not yet have known about the details he described. The information had not been released by police to the press, nor had investigators mentioned it to Anthony during questioning. Since the surveillance was not a 24-hour-a-day tactic, they would often drive by his house to see if his vehicle was parked out front. If he was home, investigators would often ask him to answer some questions. The circumstantial evidence against Anthony was mounting. During a visit to his residence, investigators noticed a manually operated camera belonging to John Newman that had been reported missing after the murders. He told detectives that the Newmans lent it to him, but when asked later to demonstrate how it worked, he seemed to have no idea how to operate it. Another item missing from the Newman house seemed to be traceable to Anthony. The tip money missing from the cookie tin consisted only of coins. Three of Anthony's friends told police they either saw him rolling coins into wrappers or saw him pay for items with wrapped coins. And then there were the prints. Anthony's palm print was found on the wall over the bed where Melissa Newman had been assaulted. Prints found on the empty cookie tin on the kitchen table matched Anthony's. His prints were also found on the living room closet door and the inside and outside of the apartment door. 
Another place we located one of uh, Kirby's fingerprints was on the back side of the door to the mother's bedroom. And again, its, its position was significant in that it uh, led us to believe that perhaps uh, someone was trying to escape out of the room and he already had some other trace evidence on his hand, he slammed the door shut, uh, transferring not only his fingerprint, but some of the other trace evidence that was found in the scene. The evidence was overwhelming. Every suspect in the month-long investigation had ultimately been cleared, except Kirby Anthony. Appreciate that. What, well, when you got home, was there anyone there? For investigators, it was time to obtain an arrest warrant. And when you got home? Judd Ray had previously cautioned investigators that the killer might try to flee if the pressure became too much. The increasing intensity of police questioning had made Anthony nervous. Judd Ray was right again. Anthony confided to his roommate, Dan Grant, that he was leaving town. He asked his friend not to tell police. Grant was afraid to contact Anchorage police because of Anthony's notorious temper. Second precinct test. Nonetheless, he did finally call them seven hours later. Okay. Anthony was heading to the Canadian border, an eight-hour drive away, and he had a seven-hour head start. Anchorage and the Canadian border are separated by hundreds of miles of uninhabited wilderness. Anthony could be hiding anywhere. Anchorage police quickly contacted U.S. Customs at the Alaska-Canada border. They described Anthony in his vehicle and told the custom official that Anthony was a suspect in a triple homicide. They were hoping he was on his way. Less than an hour later, Anthony arrived at U.S. Customs. Having no idea that investigators had been tipped off, Anthony calmly pulled up to the Customs gate. Could you get out of the car, please? He was detained and questioned until Alaska state troopers arrived. He was arrested for driving on a suspended license and returned to Anchorage. Thanks a lot for the hospitality there. As he was turned over to the Anchorage police, he was read his rights and charged. Three counts first degree murder, two counts sexual assault, and one count kidnapping. Under Alaska law, kidnapping can be charged if a victim is restrained during an assault. Melissa Newman had been tied up during the attack. He jumps up and screaming, what is this kidnapping stuff? Uh, and which struck, struck us as odd because uh, here he was charged with three counts of murder and, and two counts of uh, sexual assault. And, uh, and he's screaming about the kidnapping charge. By this time, the forensic evidence was complete enough that police believed they could reconstruct how Angie, Melissa, and Nancy were brutally murdered. The last time Cheryl Chapman saw her sister alive was Friday, March 13th. Cheryl, Paul, and Nancy had each arrived separately at the restaurant where Nancy worked to meet for drinks. <laughs> Cheryl's daughter, Kelly, had taken Nancy's girls swimming, so the adults had a night out. Paul Chapman had to leave the restaurant early to pick up his son, but planned to meet them later at Nancy's apartment. As they were leaving, Cheryl suggested that Nancy leave her car at the restaurant and ride home with her. Nancy had Saturday off, and Paul would gladly give her a ride back to her car tomorrow. I don't know. I never paid attention. You're in, what, 1130? Yeah. 
What time are you coming? Uh, 11. 11? Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead. Cheryl, Paul, and Nancy all ended up at the Newman's apartment to wait for Kelly and the girls. They sat, laughing and talking, until about 9.45 when the girls came home. Kelly had treated them to hamburgers. At about 10 p.m., Cheryl and Paul were ready to leave. Cheryl helped Nancy clear the table and put the used coffee mugs in the sink. Angie was already in her pajamas, and Melissa had gone to her room to get ready for bed. As they said goodnight, Paul told Nancy to call him the next day if she wanted a ride back to her car. Sometime between 7 a.m. and noon on Saturday, March 14th, Kirby Anthony arrived at the Newman's apartment. Kirby Anthony is the only person who knows what happened next. Perhaps Nancy refused to lend him money. Perhaps she refused a sexual advance. Perhaps she ordered him out of the apartment. In any case, his anger boiled over. indicated that part of the assault on Melissa occurred in her mother's room. Both would have had to have been restrained, and their bodies did show signs of having been bound. We are able to show through serological findings that Melissa, the eight-year-old, had been assaulted in the mother's bedroom and that she had crossed the bed and was actively bleeding at the time. And then uh, she is subdued somehow and held in a position in that room for a period of time. Melissa Newman probably witnessed the rape and murder of her mother. She then was taken back to her bedroom where she was assaulted again and killed. It was unclear whether she was killed first or last. What was certain was that she seemed to be the target of a horrible, uncontrolled rage. Nancy Newman did not call Paul Chapman the next day for a ride to her car, nor did she answer the phone when her sister tried to reach her repeatedly. Instead, she and her two daughters lay dead nearly a full day before their bodies were discovered. The particular grudge against Angie may have grown out of the few times that Anthony babysat the girls. Reportedly, he had called her a tyrant. But for those close to the victims, and for investigators working the case, nothing could explain Kirby Anthony's savagery. 
I don't really think that, that, that you could isolate any one thing that would cause a man to fly into the homicidal rage like Kirby Anthony did. Yeah, for the most part, uh, you know, I don't think that Kirby Anthony could even tell you why he would do something like that. A grieving John Newman sat in stony silence throughout his nephew's trial. After eight weeks of testimony, the jury reached a verdict on June 3, 1988. A clean-shaven Anthony seemed confident as he waited for the verdict. As each guilty verdict was read, Anthony's composure disintegrated until finally it shattered completely. He was sentenced to 357 years for his crimes. Kirby Anthony's conviction represented an almost textbook example of cooperative police work. Anchorage police provided the FBI with evidence collected from a meticulously preserved crime scene. Doug Diedrich carefully analyzed the hairs and fibers and anticipated Kirby Anthony's excuses, conducting his own home experiment to refute them. Judd Ray helped police stay several steps ahead of Anthony's thoughts and actions. And for the first time, testimony of an FBI profiler was accepted in court. It was a good case to test the waters in terms of uh, whether or not this was going to be accepted in, in our judicial system. And for that, the implications are probably uh, far-reaching uh, because it opened the door. <laughs>